Hello, I'm Jonathan Stark, and today we're going to talk about responsive web design. This session is a boot camp, meaning that we're going to cover a lot of ground quickly, so you can get started on your own responsive designs right away. Topics I'll cover include the one web philosophy and benefits, the mechanics of media queries, code organization and best practices, adding support for adaptive media, and fallback techniques for older browsers. I'd like to get started by talking about the problem that responsive web design solves. At its root, responsive web design is a reaction to a fracture that has emerged on the web, namely the m.site. So let's back up and look at some history. In 2007, Apple released the first iPhone, which promised and delivered a grown-up mobile web browsing experience, a modern smartphone browser that rendered HTML, CSS, and JavaScript just like the desktop. And it was great uh, at the time. Pages would appear zoomed out, so you could double tap to zoom in to block level elements fairly easily. So it gave you this, um, you know, it's like you were looking at the web through a, the wrong way through a telescope, but at least it, it didn't water down the browsing experience. You could zoom in real easily, pan around, and get at whatever you needed to get at. As web traffic for mobile devices started approaching desktop levels, though, site owners realized that they needed to provide a more mobile-friendly view of their content, something that was better suited to touch interactions on a small screen. Unfortunately, it was not always obvious how to implement this. Uh, here's Ad Week taking a swing at it uh, with unfortunate results. Here's uh, Craigslist. Not sure what they're trying to do there, but it uh, seems like they've got something screwed up. Out of frustration, many site owners finally decided to create device-specific sites that broke their content out across different URLs. Uh, they found that shrinking down their desktop experience to mobile using uh, CSS or, or server-side techniques was very difficult, so they just said, uh, forget it, we'll just create a mobile site, something that will look good on the iPhone. Here's an example of the Guardian, and the top panel has uh, their desktop site, and the bottom panel shows the mobile version. Uh, it's ostensibly the same page, but you can see lots of differences. The content is different. The advertising is different. Uh, the branding is, is dissimilar. So, you know, this is certainly a problem from a brand standpoint. Uh, it's also a problem because they're maintaining two different websites. Of course, that uh, is a drain on resources. But it also makes sharing links very difficult. And this is a core feature of the web, so breaking it is a problem. Uh, you can imagine if I was viewing uh, the Guardian page on my phone and I thought my mother might be interested in this article, I could email the link to her, but she'd get the M dot link. And when she loaded it on her desktop, then, you know, potentially she'd be brought to uh, the wrong view. Uh, or maybe there's some redirecting happening on the server that would redirect her to the correct URL, uh, which isn't uh, the worst thing in the world, but I see it not work in lots of cases uh, where you're, you're emailing, someone's emailing a link or sharing a link from one device context to another, and the, the redirection breaks the initial link. So she could email me a link, for example, to the desktop version of this page. Uh, I would click on it. The server would detect by sniffing my user agent uh, in the browser that I'm on an iPhone, let's say, and then redirect me to the mobile version of the Guardian, but maybe not direct me to the actual article that I'm interested in reading. So, uh, you know, this is definitely an anti-pattern and something that's really difficult to solve. Um, links, links just work, and if you start messing with them, it's difficult to recreate that ease of use. Uh, this anti-pattern got even worse when everybody got all excited about native apps and the app stores. So you see a lot of um, a lot of websites whose experience is perfectly good on mobile trying to push people to download native app versions. So here's an example of Facebooks, which is uh, nice in the sense that it's not real pushy. It allows you to do what you want to do on the web page that you've reached, um, but lets you know that you could also download a native app. Tumblr's is similarly uh, unobtrusive, but still it, it, I, I do consider it an anti-pattern uh, because links, you know, let's say I do download this app. Uh, what happens when someone sends me a link to Tumblr and I, you know, and I open it in an email on my phone or I see the link in Facebook and I tap on the link, it's going to open the web browser. It's not going to open the Tumblr app. It's not going to open the Facebook app. So the, the issue there is that 
if you are pushing people to download a native application that doesn't open up when someone links to you, then your users are gonna probably be experiencing two different versions of your app. The native one, when they just launch it directly, and the web one, when they are uh, clicking into your site via a link. Uh, which means that, I don't, I don't think native apps are necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean that people will probably be switching back and forth between the web experience and the native experience. Uh, so you do want to keep them very much in sync, keep them very similar looking and feeling so that people aren't relearning the app uh, a lot. Now, Facebook and Tumblr are good examples of this, um, but there are others that are not so good. Uh, LinkedIn and Google, for example, you know, basically throw this interstitial. So I went to a particular page, and instead of the page that I wanted, I get this ad for their app, uh, and then or the option to continue to what I wanted to do in the first place. Uh, I think this is annoying. I don't think anyone likes this. Um, and it's, it's especially bad when the, the click-through to the mobile site link is not good enough to uh, get us where we want it to go. It just sends us to the top-level mobile site. Very annoying. Um, by the same token, if I'm linking through to this, you know, if I see this interstitial ad uh, by virtue of having clicked on a link and then I open the app, I'm not ever going to, I still can't get to the link that I'm clicking on. I still have to find it somehow. So I, I see this as a bad thing. The reality is that most people get this really wrong. Uh, here's an example from the Daily Mail. And this is, you know, this is the Daily Mail, you know, detecting that we're on an iPhone and throwing an alert or a confirmation dialogue about, you know, you can, you can see what it says. It's like, it'd be much better if you downloaded the iPhone app and yada, yada, yada. What's really ironic about this is that I'm not in a web browser. I'm inside the Twitter application here. So it, it's just an example of how kind of bizarre this can get. You know, you might be thinking, oh, I'll just, you know, do some kind of some kind of um, interstitial ad or I'll, you know, throw this dialogue and then the person can just go to uh, view this in our app instead. But really they can't. There's no way to get to this page directly uh, with this kind of an approach. Uh, so, you know, it, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, whenever these alerts or interstitials are, are interrupt the user's flow, they are always going to take them out of the the task that they're trying to complete. Uh, and I just, I just, I, I don't know. I just don't think it's good. I think it's a, a bad thing. You Perhaps you're in a situation where it is a good thing, but uh, please keep all these considerations in mind when you're thinking about it. So Jeremy Keith, uh, whose opinion I respect on these matters and others. Uh, I think he put it, put it well. He says, although the practice of splintering up the same content to separate URLs and devices has been a useful interim step, it just doesn't scale and it's also unnecessary. So, uh, you know, I talked about why someone might have done this in the first place. It's really difficult to take this big desktop experience that's grown up over, you know, the course of like, say, the 90s and then early 2000s and, and whittle it down in a way that is going to create a good experience on mobile. But this is a temporary workaround. Uh, as hardware prices drop, device diversity is going to continue to increase. We're going to have a we're going to have a range of touchscreen devices that start around the size of a, a large postage stamp and go all the way up to the size of a picture window. And there's really, you know, we're not going to create uh, a different website for um, you know, desktops, tablets, phones, smartwatches and refrigerators or whatever else comes in the future. So it's just increasingly obvious that maintaining separate websites for different devices is, at best, difficult and annoying, and at worst, totally unsustainable. So the, the principle that I want you to keep in mind, that your content should be uniquely addressable across all devices. And, uh, and it really boils down to uh, the, the scalability issue of maintaining multiple websites. You just can't, it's obvious. I, I suppose it's obvious that this is um, not a long-term strategy. It's really just a workaround. So this is what responsive web design aims to repair, this, this M dot anti-pattern where content is uniquely addressable. And then the layout of that data or that, that content is determined by the context in which it's being viewed. All right, so what is responsive web design? Uh, I guess to sum it up, 
in a sentence, I'd say it's a collection of techniques that allow us to create web experiences that magically reformat themselves based on the presentation context. And the big tools in the toolbox of responsive web design are media queries, fluid grids, adaptive images, and relative units. So we'll be looking at examples of all of these things today. Ethan Marcotte wrote the definitive arc article on responsive web design for a list apart. I guess it's about a year or two ago. And he didn't, you know, he didn't invent the techniques involved, but he did give the collection a name which stuck, and it allowed us as a community to kind of rally around it and, uh, and have discussions and figure out best practices and this sort of thing. It reminds me a lot of when Jesse James Garrett coined the term Ajax for these, these uh, techniques that we're using to create partial page refreshes and you know, kick off the Web 2.0 movement. There are a couple of things that you kind of have to change your mindset about uh, when doing responsive web design. So let's talk about those. There are three big ones. First is that we've been building device-specific sites all along without realizing it. And what I mean by that, you know, web de web development, web design um, in the '90s and early 2000s, we had lots of um, issues creating pixel perfect dis uh, layouts across different browsers. We were pretty comfortable with the hardware. We didn't worry so much about what the hardware was that was that was displaying those websites. Uh, we all, as a community, kind of agreed on a minimum minimum resolution for a monitor, and you know, it started off around eight hundred by six hundred, and then we, as a group, kind of crept up to ten twenty four by seven sixty eight as larger monitors became more common. Um, you know, most of these devices had uh, relatively solid bandwidth. I mean, sure, we had dial up. Um, and 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 that was not real fast, but that went away pretty quickly. We got broadband and, and other options that were much quicker and more reliable. Um, so we didn't really have to worry about that as a as a web designer developer. You didn't really worry about whether or not a device was going to lose a connection in the middle of a session. The other thing about the bandwidth is that uh, I think without exception, at least in the U.S., there is no it's an all you can eat model. There's no metering. You know, you, you pay by the month and you access the internet. That's it. It's not a question of how much uh, data you consume. You can consume as much as you want uh, up to, you know, up to the, your download speed maximums. You know, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's not like you're going to pay more if you're downloading a lot of movies. Uh, all of these devices, desktop and laptop devices, had, a, you know, basically the same pixel density. Um, you could count on them having some kind of mouse pointer input, whether it was a mouse or a trackpad or trackball or what have you. Um, they all have keyboards, you know, a large physical keyboard. They have tons of storage space on their local disk drives or, or solid state drives. And there's plenty of memory, at least for web browsing. Another thing is that power consumption wasn't really a serious concern. Uh, certainly desktop machines would be plugged into a power outlet and laptop machines were easy to plug in, uh, or, and they also have large batteries and, and good battery life, so we didn't really have to worry about uh, with our websites, whether or not our website was going to consume a lot of power. Of course, these days, most of, the, uh, most of those considerations are no longer something we can rely on. We have to worry about screen size, you know, physical dimensions of the screen, uh, the pixel density on the screen, everything from, say, around 100 pixels per inch up to uh, over 300 which causes us to uh, have to worry about what images we're sending down. Uh, of course, now we've got touch and gesture input. That's huge, not necessarily mouse pointer. But we could also have soft keyboards, hard keyboards, uh, voice input or trackball input, or even D-pads on some phones. Uh, we've got bandwidth considerations where, you know, people are, are having to pay for the data that we're sending to them, essentially. We're taking, we're taking megabytes off their data plan, so we want to be um, judicious about how much we send down from a cost standpoint, but also from a performance standpoint, because this is the you know these connections are probably not super fast. Most people are going to be having 3G uh, or worse. You know LTE is rolling out, but uh, it's not everywhere yet. Um, we've also got intermittent connectivity. Even if even if somebody does have an LTE connection, they might be going to a subway tunnel or uh, in a building, and they just lose connectivity in the middle of a browsing session. It's much more likely on mobile that we have to worry about this than on desktop. Battery life is a huge concern. Uh, we need to worry about, um, say, uh, say we have an application or mobile web app that uses the geolocation feature, then that can really eat up. If you're watching the uh, if you're watching the GPS, you can really kill someone's battery fast. 
Um, so you need we need to be careful about that. Uh, maybe the biggest deal is that um, that mobile users are probably not sitting at a desk, uh, you know, with both hands free <laughs> in their computing session. They're probably walking around. Uh, they might be sitting on the couch with kids running all over the place. They might be standing in a line at a coffee shop. You know, you, you can't really um, presume any kind of posture or, uh, or level of concentration uh, or any of that. It's a much different context to be programming for. Uh, okay, so the next thing uh, we need to get our heads around when we embark on a responsive web design is that we want to build from the content out, not the canvas in. This is really, really important, and it's really hard to get used to. Uh, but once you do, it's great. Um, so speaking of the desktop, right? It, what we've been you for 10 years, 15 years, we've been coding for this w relatively large monitor. You know, say approximately we've got a thousand pixels horizontally to work with, and the I think the approach in most cases has been to sit down and say, okay, I've got this 1024 by 768 canvas and I've got all this content over here. I'm going to start positioning my content in this canvas and designing it and making it look pretty. But we have to flip this on our head because we have no idea how big the canvas is anymore. Right? So you need to think of your content first. Your content becomes your product, not a particular experience of your content, not a particular layout of your content. So the way to do this is first define the atomic unit of your content. So for Twitter, it would probably be a tweet. Uh, for you know, WordPress, it would be a story. Or uh, a, a newspaper would be an article, this kind of thing. And stop thinking about containers. Stop storing data uh, for a particular container. So um, you don't want to be thinking about, when you're worrying about your content, you, don't, you should not be thinking about some, the concept of uh, things like pages uh, or spreads. It, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, it's really hard to change your thinking away from this, but it's important that you do. Uh, similar, a related topic is that in the CMS, your content management system, uh, you obviously you're going to store your content in there, but you want to be careful not to also let uh, it get polluted with layout information. So anything that describes what your content should look like or where it should sit on a page, as soon as you start think, hearing uh, container type elements like page, you're doing something wrong and you're going to cause a problem for yourself. You can imagine if you, uh, even embedding HTML in your content can be a bad thing because if this content then is going to get, you know, th this content could get rendered somewhere that doesn't render HTML. For example, in an SMS message or um, on the LCD readout of a car stereo. So, you know, you wouldn't want angle brackets all over the place on somebody's car radio. Uh, you need to have a clean, layout agnostic version of your content. Uh, again, this might this might not, maybe this sounds hard, but maybe it doesn't, uh, but I assure you that this is a huge shift in thinking. Uh, if you think of um, WordPress, for example, the admin console in WordPress where you're, you know, publishing uh, blog posts and it gives you this sort of watered down Microsoft Word WYSIWYG uh, text editor allows you to say bold text or or what have you. Uh, Basecamp is another one. Basecamp uses this. Um, it's got this little WYSIWYG editor that allows you to create bulleted lists and this sort of thing. Storing that data in the database uh, mixed with your content is a major problem uh, because of the reasons I've already outlined. You don't know where it's going to end up showing up, so you can't assume that it's going to be in an RTF environment or in a in an HTML environment could go to an SMS, it could go to a, a, a radio screen, it could go to an ebook. Uh, who knows where it's going to go? So you just have to have it clean, clean, clean. Um, it's, it's part of the reason why this is difficult is because of our the tools that we're using. A lot of times we're not using a pure CMS in the back end to store our data and manage our content. We're using web publishing tools like WordPress or Drupal or these sorts of things. So um, you want to, you know, so the tools kind of work against you, uh, or they can work against this desire to keep your content really clean and pure. Um, all right, so moving on from there. The next thought I want you to consider is starting small. As I've mentioned already, starting with a desktop width design and trying to work your way down to a mobile width design is very, very difficult. And I think there are two reasons for this. One is that it's it's easier 
uh, to start, because of the way CSS works, it's just easier to add more rules as you go up and not try and be removing things as you go down. So if you start with a small screen, small screen real estate, and you have all your default styles like colors and fonts and um, uh, all that sort of basic stuff that's kind of mood boardy brand guideline stuff, you have that all set. Um, as you as your window size gets bigger, it's it's a lot easier to um, add things into the mix than it is to try and override them later in the mix. So we'll talk about that in specifics uh, later, but it's going to be uh, all about using min width media queries, not max width media queries. The other thing about starting small is that it forces hard decisions to the surface. Uh, when you've got a lot of when you've got a large canvas. You know, you've got this desktop site, 1024 by 768, or maybe even bigger. You don't have to make hard decisions about what content is going to be at the top, let's say, or what, what primary content is versus secondary or tertiary content. Um, a lot of times, especially in organizations, these kind of decisions are really hard to make because lots of different departments are involved. And everyone's kind of jockeying for position to be above the fold on the home page. And when you get down to a, you know, a, a 320 by 480 screen, you know, a phone screen, it's less is going to fit. You know, you can't, you know, unless you zoom way out uh, to the point where text is unreadable, something is going to have to be below the fold. And making those decisions early are forced to the surface when you start small. All right. So once we have all those things in mind, you can start thinking about responsive web design. It's, re it's really not rocket science. Uh, it's pretty straightforward at a high level. We're going to use relative units, media queries, adaptive images, and videos to create layouts that just rework themselves to fill the available space more, uh, more nicely. Unfortunately, it's not a silver bullet, and it can be really difficult uh, to implement depending on a variety of factors. First would be if your CMS was polluted with layout instructions like HTML or rich text. Uh, that can make it hard. Uh, designers also have a hard time breaking the canvas, canvas first habits. I know I did. Even when I thought I had totally drunk the Kool-Aid on, um, on content first, I still found myself thinking in terms of um, pages uh, and other, other container style elements. Another thing, which is more process than, than tech, is that marketing uh, people and brand, brand managers find it really hard to accept the fact that pixel perfection of the content experience is, is really not something that can be controlled. And we, you know, web designers and developers are used to dealing with trying to make things pixel perfect and how difficult it can be across different browsers. But now imagine uh, we need to, you know, how would you have a design review of a design at every single width, uh, pixel by pixel from, say, 300 pixels wide to 1,200 pixels wide? Like, who's going to say, oh, you know, you can't, you can't review that. I mean, everything's going to be reflowing. Content's going to be moving around. And certainly, I think it makes more sense to worry about more, take a more of a style guide approach to it and say, you know, we want our fonts to be, uh, you know, relative this size relative to each other, our headings relative to our body copy and our line height, and um, the colors are going to be like this. And you know, it's more it's more about kind of a style guide, mood boardy approach to the uh, to the branding, and less about you know rearranging the furniture. You know, like that that needs to just happen the way it's going to happen. And I'll just give you a quick example of that. And we already saw an example of of a web page being displayed within the Twitter app. So, uh, so it, it's just another example of not knowing where your web page is going to be displayed. So you might think, oh, people are going to come to my web page in mobile Safari on the iPhone, and I've got uh, X number of pixels for the viewport, and we're going to, we're going to organize everything perfectly to fit there. And then the user who's browsing on the site, they turn on um, a portable hotspot, which takes away about 40 pixels from the top well it's not quite 40 maybe it's 25 pixels from the top of the screen uh, uh, to indicate that you've got a, a hotspot connection going on so now you've lost a bunch of pixels what's your design going to do is your design going to respond to that loss of pixels you know your the the website your website's still going to think the user's on an iphone and the user is still on an iphone and they still are using mobile safari 
but for you know a reason that you didn't predict, they have less real estate than you thought they would. I, I could go on and on with examples of this. Um, you know, UI web views embedded inside of Twitter, or Facebook, or other apps. You never know how much real estate you're going to have, uh, so you you really just don't want to make decisions in that way. You can't control the experience of your content anymore. So, all right, enough about that. Let's move on to um, bostonglobe.com. And uh, I th what I'll do, I'll just, I'm going to switch over and just demonstrate the site for you, to give you an idea. If you haven't seen uh, responsive web design in action before, it's pretty cool the first time you see it. Okay, so here's the bostonglobe.com. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do is just downsize this window. And you can, if you pay close attention, you'll see things shift around. So we're starting off with uh, a three column layout. And watch as the, you'll see the images resize slightly. You'll see that the images are maintaining their aspect ratio as they resize. You can see that the columns are um, relative width. So they stay approximately the same size relative to each other. Once it becomes uh, too small to fit uh, the two columns, they get too narrow for them to be reasonably displayed. It switches to a two column view from a three column. That third column of tertiary content pops down to the bottom. As we go smaller and smaller, you can see that the navigation is changing around. You can see that we switch to one column now, so like a long scrolling view. And in contrast to the Guardian example that we saw in the slides earlier, this is clearly the same site. It's clearly the same branding. Uh, in spite of the fact that lots of furniture has been rearranged, uh, it, it's got a cohesive experience. And we did not change URLs. This is the important point. This URL has stayed the same. This is not some JavaScript resize shenanigans that's redirecting uh, the window location or anything like that. This is uh, CSS just shifting things around so that uh, the content is displayed appropriate to the amount of real estate that it has. So you can see the navigation has collapsed into uh, a list. If we resize the window, it goes back to this top tab navigation across here. So the, the bostonglobe.com was the first big um, public example of responsive web design. And it was, you know, Ethan Marcotte was on the team that helped do this. So uh, if anybody could have implemented such a large project properly, it would be Ethan. Um, all right. So with that, what I want to do is switch over to a, uh, a much simpler example of, 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 of a responsive website that just focuses on a few of the key pieces. Uh, and, and, you know, the Boston Globe site is extremely complex. It would be difficult to go through this and do sort of a case study of it. So I'm going to do a simple example and uh, illustrate each point uh, as individually as possible. And we can see how they all work together to create a responsive web design. Okay, so if you want to follow along at home, um, I've got uh, just a text editor here. And also I'm going to be using the browser. And we've got just this little uh, test website. It's called uh, it's called Rabble, and there's got some images in here. We'll talk about that. And we've got a couple of CSS files in here. We'll talk about those. Um, but really, it's all about this index file initially. Pretty straightforward. Let's open it in the browser so you can see what it looks like. And as you see this at different sizes, you can see things move around. It hits a max width at a certain point. I believe it's 900 pixels. Uh, as I size it down, the logo jumps to the center. You can see this big screenshot here is uh, downsizing and maintaining its aspect ratio. Uh, if we could look a little farther down, I've got these three columns. At the wider widths, they have uh, icons. And then we run out of space for the icons. When they get too narrow, then they pop into a single view. So similar, similar concepts to what we saw on uh, the Boston Globe site, but it's much easier to dissect. All right, so let's leave this over here. Look at the source code real quick. There's not a lot to it, really. Um, we've got a um, head and a body. Let's look at the body first. 
Here we've got, uh, here we'll collapse that. A couple of major sections. We've got the header, which is this area up here. We've got um, this hero section, which is this big screenshot. The main content, which are these three, um, uh, three columns implemented as an unordered list. And then we've got uh, this form section down here and the footer navigation. So not, you know, it's a pretty standard style uh, HTML structure for a website. Header, primary content, secondary content, some columns, and navigation. All right. Now let's look at the header. Or sorry, the head of the HTML. Oops. And in the head, we've got um, just a title, and then we've got this viewport declaration. And this is important because uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, what this meta tag does is it tells the device that um, we do, we're sort of, we're mobile aware. So the author of this site is mobile aware. And I want the, uh, the desktop, uh, sorry, the mobile browser, instead of zooming way out and assuming that we're a desktop site that needs to be, you know, like reverse telescope style. Uh, we want it to assume that the page content is whatever the device width is. So this we use this nice device width keyword here to indicate to the browser that you know if you're 320 pixels wide, make this make this content appear as if it's in a window that's 320 pixels wide instead of zooming way out on 900 960 or whatever the default is. Then we can see the initial scale. So you know these uh, mobile browsers will zoom in and out very easily from double tap. And uh, if you don't tell it, it you know you, you pretty much always want it to start at initial scale of one. And then these second two properties are debatable whether or not you want to use them. You have to decide uh, whether or not these are appropriate for you or not. The first one is max scale. And by setting it to one, it means that the, the, uh, the viewport will not scale up. And user scalable basically does the same thing. So if we say user scalable no, then it, the you know the user is not allowed to zoom in. And this is not necessarily a good thing. Um, if you have inline links, for example, it can be convenient to allow the user to zoom in, so it's easier to uh, touch them because the touch targets become larger. Uh, it could also be different dif difficult from an accessibility standpoint sometimes to read text, so the user might want to just zoom in. So. You might not want to add these if you were going to leave them out. It would look like this. But I put them in there so you uh, would be aware of the syntax in case you did have a business case for putting those in. OK, so that's the viewport. Now let's look at our CSS links. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I've broken them into two. Uh, in, in practice, you would probably minify them and compile them into one uh, style sheet just so you didn't make multiple network requests. But I thought it would be easier to talk through by separating out the enhancements in this separate enhanced.css file. So all of our media queries are in there. A big um, sort of concept in responsive web design is that the first media query is no media query. And uh, the situation there is that, that some devices don't support media queries. Some browsers don't support media queries. So in a case where you don't, Ha, you know, an older browser that doesn't understand media queries, you want to deliver them some kind of experience. Uh, and that is another reason why you should, you know, your default base styles should be for mobile first. So start small, be, build your base styles for mobile, something that will look good on mobile. And if the, if the browser uh, is powerful enough and modern enough to understand media queries, as the viewport gets bigger and bigger, your new media, your new style rules um, are going to come into effect. If the browser is not capable of understanding media queries, it's just going to ignore all that stuff. So the user is going to get that base default experience that's you know pretty good. So this is kind of a kind of similar to the argument uh, between um, progressive enhancement versus graceful degradation. Uh, what I'm advocating here is a progressive enhancement of a default style that will work well everywhere. So if we, let's actually, let's comment this out, in fact. And I want to show you the, um, the website experience again. Starting really narrow. Well, let's refresh that, of course. And if we look down, so let's say I'm coming to this page in an underpowered old school mobile device. It doesn't support media queries. 
um, you know, most browsers like that are going to be on a phone. They're probably not going to be on a desktop environment. But if they were, if I didn't understand media queries here, and I scale the site up, it just gets bigger and bigger. And it doesn't pop in the columns and whatnot. But it's still totally usable. You know, it's it could be prettier, but, you know, it's still totally usable. If we had taken a reverse approach and done the desktop design as the default, and we had those, you know, multiple columns and extra images and all that stuff, uh, it would be, it would look horrible, you know, and if we were trying to use media queries to say, you know, below 320 pixels, um, uh, take these columns and turn them into one column. Uh, if the device doesn't understand media queries, then they'd be looking at three columns here adjacent to each other, which would be terrible. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's progressive enhancement over graceful degradation. All right, so let's undo this and open up the actual CSS files. And we'll go right around here. So here's the default CSS. Um, I've So like I said, we start off with uh, default stuff that would be true all over the place. And I'll, I'll go through this, call out some interesting things as we go through. But this is all very basic CSS. There's nothing fancy in here. And then in the enhanced CSS file, that's where I put all the media queries. And here's the first one, starts on line two. I'll talk about each of them individually and what's going on there. But again, if this, if the browsing, uh, if the browser that is visiting this page doesn't understand media queries, this file will get completely ignored. All right, so let's, I'm gonna scroll through here and call out uh, the interesting parts of default.css. Just got some colors, uh, that's no big deal. Here I'm using uh, a relative unit, M's, for border radius. So let's talk about M's for a second. Um, all things being default in a web browser, an M basically, one M basically uh, amounts to 16 pixels. So 16 pixels equals one M at the default zoom. Um, if you set all of your, all of your measurements in pixels, and someone changes the default zoom, then anything, you know, then the text is going to get bigger, but your, in this case, border radius, radiuses, or border radii, are not going to get bigger. And this can be um, ugly, to put it bluntly, uh, when it's, you know, when it, it uh, especially with things like margin and padding and line height or, you know, a bunch of different things. It, be, it can look really weird when you've got this bigger or smaller text, but your other elements didn't resize at all. And it might, you might think, oh, well, you know, browsers these days do a full page zoom. They're not just, just uh, making the text bigger, as was the case back in the day, or at least more common. But the reality is that lots of browsing devices these days still have um, uh, OS level settings and browser settings that by default affect the zoom of your page. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about uh, smart TVs, which have a very generally have a, a, a zoom applied by default to the text. And Android phones have um, zoom levels that can be defined uh, in the browser. So these these things, uh, people zoom is what I'm trying to say. There are places where people zoom by default, by accident, or on purpose. Uh, so this becomes very useful this relative measure because as the as the zoom increases, the baseline font you know, if, if one M, if someone zooms, then one M could, you know, then equal 24 pixels and our, and certain elements that we want to scale up with the text will scale up. Um, what else can I tell you about M's? Uh, it can be weird getting used to M's if you're used to pixels, but I think, uh, at least for me, that was just because of familiarity. You know, I kind of, when I was looking at a design, I knew that 10 pixels would be enough padding around some given thing that I wanted to uh, work with. And, uh, and, and converting that to M's uh, became tedious after a while. So the, the way that you would do that, let's say I was going to, oh, I don't know, um, I was gonna put a margin of 20 pixels around the uh, side in the footer. And you know, I, I can mentally, I can visualize how much space that's gonna give me. I wouldn't necessarily, if I'm new to M's, I wouldn't know how many M's to use, but I can calculate that by dividing by 16, and I'm using TextMate here, you can actually evaluate and replace the selection like so. 
and that would give me uh, 1.25 ms. And I found that uh, after a while of doing this, I started to be able to picture how many ms to use. So I it it didn't be it didn't really it wasn't this ongoing annoyance of having to convert ms to pixels. I just started using ms because I kind of knew how big 0.625 ms was. Uh, and I believe that you'll have the same experience as you get used to using this stuff. Uh, so scrolling down, you can see that um, I chose a couple of places. I know there are some places in here where I uh, used pixels. I'm looking for one that's worth mentioning. Okay, here's a spot where I used pixels. And I specifically did that because that it's it's defining the background size for an actual image, which has an actual pixel size. Uh, so you, converting to M's is going to do me no good there. Uh, so that's the case when you're dealing with images. Another place I always use pixels is border width. I f for some reason, I find that when... Um, uh, I'm sure there are exceptions to this, but in general, when I uh, do border width and we zoom in, the increased border thickness... Is usually becomes very distracting very quickly and it usually looks better to just leave it at a fixed width uh, your designs might might be different than mine I'm sure they probably are and uh, and you might choose to do otherwise but I have found that pixels work better with in border width uh, other relative measurements are percentages and I tend to use the uh, percentages for uh, for things like columns and 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 block level sections of a document, not so much for um, uh, margin and padding. I, I I'm not. I don't, it's, it would seem weird to me to do margin and padding and percentages. I'm not even sure it's possible to tell you the truth. Um, but I use it for uh, you know, uh, we'll see in the media queries. I use it for the columns in particular. Another place to use uh, a percentage is on images. Where's my image? See right here. Uh, this is on line 107. I set images to be width 100%. So that means that they're going to uh, pick a width that is um, based on their parent container, their containing element. And that is why, because of this, this width uh, rule right here, that's why that this inline image, this screenshot here, that's why it resizes instead of overflowing as I scroll the window down. If I didn't do this, let's sh let me show you what it would look like if I didn't. It would look like that, and that's obviously bad. So the really, really cool thing to point out is that the browser automatically calculates the appropriate height so that the aspect ratio stays the same, which is a huge benefit. Uh, we'll see later that video doesn't work that way, and we have to use some JavaScript to work around that. So that's real nice. Um, OK. So I think that's probably all the interesting things. That's all. Those are all the interesting rules inside of the default CSS. So let's move over to enhance and talk about media queries. All right. So organize my windows a little. All right. Um, so I alluded to this, I, I, I'll probably keep banging this drum, I've said it a couple times already, you really want to start small and work your way up. So the default styles that we just looked at will apply to every browser, and then in this enhance.css, we say, all right, we're going to set some media queries that if, if it turns out that we've got more real estate um, than, than, in this case, 600 pixels, if it turns out we've got more real estate, I'm going to add these rules in um, maybe override a couple of things, but I'm mostly just adding rules that will enhance the experience once we get over 600 pixels. Uh, so the syntax might look familiar if you've ever written a print style sheet. The basic concept is you use this at media screen and you can add a conditional. And here I'm saying min width. So once we hit 600 pixels, the CSS rules that are uh, CSS declarations in this block are going to trigger. Uh, I could have gone like so. Oops. Divide this by 16. M's do work here. And perhaps it would have made more sense for me to do M's there. It probably does. Um, but but I put pixels. In future, I probably would do M's. But we'll leave this like this so it matches your example files. 
Um, okay, so interesting things I do in here. Um, so once we hit 600 pixels, we go right around here. Okay, right around 600 pixels, the big difference is the three columns. So boom, and switch to three columns. All right, and let's look at that. So here, I, I oh, also the footer. Let me demonstrate that as well. So down in the footer, all of our links are in this one single vertical column. And then once I go over, they go, they become in line. Not the most attractive design, but you get the idea. So now there are two lines of navigation. So here, uh, this display inline block is what's making that happen. And I'm changing the padding on the uh, changing the padding on the link elements in that navigation. Okay, so then in the features section, um, I set the text alignment to center, and then for each individual li, which are these um, these columns here, I do a bunch of things. First, I set them to inline block, and uh, I set give them a little bit of margin. <clears throat> I set the min height so they, these call to actions are pushed down to the same place and uh, uh, set them to position relative, yada, yada, yada. So all of this stuff is actually basic fluid design type stuff. But the point, the, the key point is that the, um, this rule or this declaration block only comes into effect over 600 pixels. Okay. Now moving down to the next media query, once we hit 900 pixels, we're going to add some different rules. And I believe the most notable ones. Yeah, so the, the most interesting stuff is uh, really the icons, but you'll see once I hit 900 pixels, logo pops over to the left, and these icons show up here. So how did I do that? Each one of these is... Uh, here, let me of the developer tools. Talk this to the bottom. All right. All right, so each one of these is uh, bingo, there we go, okay. Each one of these is an H3. And if you look over here, I add this, you can see that there's a background image applied to it. And I've got the three different background images, the, the chat thing, the heart, and the puzzle piece. Those are here in images. And you can see I've got uh, the heart, the puzzle, and the forum chat thing. And maybe you can tell by the file naming that, uh, the, you know, these... Th the, this one is a 32 pixel square version, and then this I've also got double sized ones that are uh, twice as no, double sized ones that are 64 pixels square. So what I'm doing here is saying, uh, okay, once we hit 900 pixels width, we've got room to fit these icons in those H3s. So I'm going to add this background image, and I just point to the one that's appropriate for the uh, for the column. And then I specify the background size specifically. And this is redundant because that's the size they would come in at normally at 30 because, you know, because they are 32 pixels square. So we, it's a little bit redundant to put this background size in, but it does uh, make a difference later uh, in, in a upcoming media query that we'll look at shortly. All right, so now... There's another thing we have to worry about that we haven't talked about too much so far, which is not just the resizing of the window up and down, you know, having a different size viewport, but also we need to worry about pixel density on the screen because um, the way a uh, high density screen works, or let's just talk about retina screens because it's easy. Um, the iPad, the way that it works on an iPad, uh, retina iPad, is that images, let's say you've got an image that's 10 pixels square. If you if the browser did nothing uh, when it went to your website, your image that took up 10 pixels square would really only take up 5 pixels square on the screen. So all of our background images or inline images would just be like that upper left-hand quadrant 
they would take up you know a quarter of the space they normally took up and that wouldn't look good at all of course so to compensate for that safari automatically pixel doubles the images and applies a sort of a, a to me it looks like it applies a little bit of a compression blur of some kind um, so it makes the image fill up the space that it should but the reality is it doesn't have all the pixels it needs to properly do that because the image is too small to start with to, to accommodate each of the pixels that are available on a retina screen. So it looks terrible. Um, I'm not real picky when it comes to, you know, I'm not like a designer's designer. Uh, I'm more of a developer, but even I can see that the, uh, the images look blurry and a little cloudy. They don't look good. So um, what we can do is check for the device pixel ratio. So on line 74, say so media screen, and WebKit min device pixel ratio two. So that would that would basically indicate a, uh, a retina, dis uh, yeah, a retina display. You can put, um, you know, 1.5 in there. There's a lot of different Android resolutions and you can go nuts with this if you want. Uh, we're gonna talk more about images and image strategies in a little bit. So I'll leave it at that for now. But the, the situation is that we uh, use the higher resolution uh, background image here for this logo at the top on a retina screen. Uh, I can't really demonstrate that because this isn't a retina device. And there's no way for me to like switch that around, but um, I can assure you that it does work. And if you, if, if you view these example files on your phone, say you have a retina iPhone or a high resolution Android device, uh, you will be getting the higher resolution image. Uh, okay, so I'm doing the same thing here with uh, this media screen uh, and min pixel width 900 and WebKit min device pixel ratio 2. So uh, illustrating, first of all, here that um, you can put multiple conditionals in a media query. And, and you can see here that I'm specifying background images that are the higher resolution variety. And the reason why these don't pixel double the same way that uh, anything else would pixel double and therefore take up way too much space uh, in the column view, the reason they don't is because we have explicitly said that we want the background size to be 32 pixels. So we're telling Safari that we don't want it to do its default behavior. We'll take care of the image sizing. You don't worry about it and just make them fit 32 pixels. So let me actually, uh, let's see. I wish there was a way I could demonstrate this in a higher resolution. I wonder if I can do it with the simulator. Let's try that. I don't know if this will work. It takes a second to launch. Say iPad Retina. Zoom it down so we can fit it in the window and rotate left. All right, so here's our iPad. Let's open up Safari and go to this URL. Sorry for the messy screen. All right, great. So you can see here that the, the retina image is being displayed here. If I uh, open this for you, you'll see that the retina logo is modified vis visually so you can see that the actual uh, the correct image is being used. All right, and if we scroll down, These are the high resolution versions of those, uh, those graphics. And what I'm gonna do is go to the CSS and comment out this background size stuff on one of these. And you can see that since we're not telling it specifically what size to set it at, it's using the 64 pixel square dimensions of the image itself, and it's, it, it's pixel doubling it, which we don't want. So that's just a long way of, around of demonstrating why you have to set the background size and what effect it will have. Uh, I find it easiest to um, 
to set the background size at the redundant point, if you will, so the place where it is redundant, uh, and then just modify the background image for the 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 wherever your pixel ratio media queries are. Um, it feels a little cleaner to me, but you, I could have put this down here like that as well. I don't know. I just don't like it there. I guess it's a style thing. Okay, so that is, those are all of the big uh, points around media queries that I wanted to talk about. Um, as I said earlier, it's not rocket science. Uh, it's just a question of... of um, getting yourself into a mindset where you're going, you're starting small and working your way up, progressively enhancing, uh, it's way, way easier to do it that way. And I, I think if you try to do it the other way, you will find that you think responsive web design is terrible and too hard, and not worth the problem. But uh, I assure you, you will like it if you start small and work your way up. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is... Um, uh, adaptive images and this this is talk about no silver bullet uh, this is a complicated topic area and something that there is no one right answer for yet um, but you know we, we just looked at uh, an approach for serving appropriate sized images to a retina screen in our CSS uh, but there are images in the display. For example, the screenshot in the uh, in that um, where was it? The Rabble site, right? This screenshot is not not defined in CSS. This is an actual image tag. So you know we can't use CSS media queries to alter the resolution of that item. And there are a bunch of different um, approaches to dealing with inline images that are in use today. And I think depending on your situation, one or the other might be more appropriate. So what I'm going to do is just tell you the uh, issues evolved, and you can decide for yourself. Um, one approach is to send high-resolution images to everybody and have the browser downsize them appropriately. And this has obvious advantages of, you know, you not having to render multiple image sizes, but it's got the major drawback of increasing the amount of data that you're sending down to the devices. Um, and it's got the, you know, added issue of uh, performance. So it's, it's like you're costing the user more money or more data from their data plan. And the, uh, and your pages are going to load slower because the files are bigger. And then the browser has to downsize them. So there, there's like a lot of overhead there. So then you could flip that around and say, okay, I'm going to serve low resolution images to everybody, but someone on, say, an iP a Retina Display iPad is just going to be like, God, these images look terrible. Uh, so that's not good either. And there are some approaches where you can, you know, there are a lot of different sort of hacky workarounds where you can maybe detect the, um, the, you know, serve low res, Im res images and detect that you're on a resolution uh, that's, you know, high, a retina display with JavaScript, and then redo all your image requests to kind of, pr you know, progressively enhance the resolution of those images. So adding basically like loaders uh, f in all those places. Uh, and all, I think all, all of these approaches, I think, have obvious drawbacks. Um, the one I'm going to talk about in a little bit more depth is this adaptive images. Uh, adaptive-images.com and the approach here is a server-side approach that you know is is by default works with uh, Apache 2 PHP 5 or greater um, with GDlib installed and what you do is add an HT access file to your web root and this adaptive-images.php file to your uh, document root folder as well uh, you add some JavaScript into your um, into your document, but that's less interesting. But the the point is, what happens is when images uh, image requests are sent to your server, they the HD access file f uh, channels them through the adaptive images.php file, and that uh, has PHP look in a cache folder to say, hey, have I generated an appropriate sized image for this particular browsing context yet? And it'll either say, yes, here it is, and it'll return that image. Uh, or 
it will say, no, we don't have one. It'll generate an appropriate one on the fly and send that back down to the user and cache that one uh, on the server side so it doesn't have to be generated again. So this is really doing two, two jobs for you. One is that it allows you to just define your image source URLs normally, as you normally would, point them to actual images that actually exist on your server. Uh, you just generate high resolution images and put them there and the PHP file will automatically generate lower resolution versions for you. So that's real nice. You don't have to do that. Um, the, the, the really big problem with this that is that I don't really see a good way around is that the internet <laughs> basically is going to not know which image is which. So this kind of goes back to the concept of content being uniquely addressable. Some people browsing your website on a phone uh, are going to get a small image for, let's say, your logo. Let's say you've got a file called logo.jpg. Uh, that might be uh, 100 pixels wide for some people, and that might be 400 pixels wide for other people who are browsing on a desktop. And that's all well and good until those things get cached, uh, or if you're using a CDN or something like that. Uh, because then someone, other browsers in the area uh, say, you know, uh, let's say I'm browsing on my iPhone and then somebody else is browsing on a, a retina iPad right next to me and we end up hitting the same CDN or you know content delivery network that's you know CDN stands for uh, they they the requests never make it to my web my PHP file on my web server because they get um, responded to by a caching server somewhere in, in between and end up with the wrong image regardless because the server didn't have a chance to respond dynamically with an image so that is that may or may not be a problem for you um, it's it you know it just depends on your situation uh, there are things going on that are worth knowing about in the HTML spec that could potentially address this uh, one is being able to supply multiple image sources for the image tag uh, in a way that is sort of sort of media query ask where you say you know based on some parameters serve this image and based on other parameters serve that image and you actually do provide different URLs for each another approach or another uh, change to the spec is the picture element that is going to allow multiple sources similar to HTML5 video tag where you can have um, you know more than one source image available uh, so, but all of that stuff, that's going to take a long time to get to find and make it into the spec and make it into, you know, become formalized and make it into browsers. So we have to basically just do the best we can with the tools that we have uh, in the meantime. Um, okay, so those are images. Now let's talk about, real quick, about video. The problem with video is that uh, it, it, you can set the video width to 100% but it doesn't maintain its aspect ratio as it's scaling down. And the only real approach I've seen to uh, solve this problem is this uh, fitvids.js approach, fitvids approach, uh, that you can visit at fitvids.js.com. And it's a jQuery plugin that uh, essentially recalculates the uh, height appropriate to the width and just fixes the aspect, aspect ratio. And really, I think this is our best option for the time being. Um, you know, if you want to have responsive video on your site. All right, and with that, I'm going to jump back to slides just to wrap up. Uh, here's a, uh, a list of um, useful articles that I found um, helpful when putting this talk together. These are things that I refer to frequently. Uh, for one reason or another, just to see what the state of the art is and to um, uh, maybe remind myself of this or that. So these are good things to visit if you like. And uh, if you have any questions about this or anything else, you can ping me on Twitter at Jonathan Stark. And I, I try to do a really good job of getting back to, each, uh, getting back to people real quickly with uh, quick answers to their questions. Thank you very much for your time.